songwriters. Welcome back to another edition of At Home Songwriting. Today, I wanted to tell you about something that I'm trying to do with this channel as well, and that's introduce you to other songwriters that are writing songs at home and learning just like you are. So today we're gonna to talk to a at-home songwriter from Washington, DC. His name's Patrick Kozub. And he and I are gonna talk a lot about sort of his beginning in songwriting and just some other tips that might help you find that you're not alone out there and there's a lot of people learning just like you. So let's check out Patrick's interview. Let's go. Welcome back to At Home Songwriting. Today we're talking to Patrick Kozub. He's a songwriter in Washington, DC that's joining us. And we're gonna have a conversation about how he got started and just kind of dive into at-home songwriting and find out how Patrick's journey can help you write some better songs. So Patrick, welcome to the, the channel. Thanks, Chad, it's great to be here. Awesome, so as I mentioned, you're in Washington, DC. I'm in Minnesota. We actually met through a songwriting group, so songwriting brought us together. So maybe introduce yourself to the, the channel watchers and, and um, the other songwriters out there. Just give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, so um, my name's Patrick. I actually met Chad through an MAS group. Um, during COVID, I was looking for a way to kind of expand not only my, my knowledge, but also to meet some more people who were interested in this really cool craft. So yeah, so I found a group on Meetup, happened to be uh, one of your classes, Chad, and and uh, the rest, as they say, is history there. Um, I've been writing for about three years. Um, I've written lots of songs. Uh, only a few of them do I play out, but uh, but I've definitely developed an enjoyment of the process. And, and uh, here I am today, so. So um, do you remember what the topic was for the first workshop that you attended? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to say, I don't, you, you've done so many excellent ones. I can't, I can't <laughs> pick out uh, which one it was. So. Cool. Well, yeah. So what Patrick is talking about is Minnesota Association of Songwriters. I've been working with them since around 2007 off and on. And uh, lead monthly workshops there, as well as now the monthly at-home songwriting workshop. So a lot of, lot of stuff going on. So Patrick, you said three years writing, you said a lot of songs. Do you have any idea how many songs you've written within that time frame? Oh man, that's a really good question. So uh, the first few months, I, I, I didn't write so many. I think uh, I, I really just began to put lines together. Um, I, I would say I, I've probably written a good 250 songs or so i i really challenged myself um during the last couple of years to to try and get 100 songs in a year and they're all really rough i had to kind of establish a criteria that it was a you know a lyric and something recorded with an instrument played to it and and of course singing on top of that which is an instrument too um but i, I would say about 250 or so awesome I've heard the saying that, you know, you really don't start songwriting until you've written about a hundred songs. So you're, you know, you're kind of on, on that track. What inspired you? Like, what was that spark where you're like, I'm going to write songs. Were you into music or where did that come from? I think it started back in high school. So I was in high school. This was kind of, I guess, right before cell phones became a really big thing. And my friends and I would go, to music stores. We were in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a beautiful college town. And that was when I really started to listen to some of the music that I would come to really enjoy. So things like uh, Oasis, um, uh, you know, uh, Margo and the Nuclear So-and-Sos is an, an indie band out of Indiana. Um, ben Folds, I, I really began to love, you know, those groups. Um, and I think what I, what I began to notice is that these songs made me feel something, you know, so it, it was, I guess, a way to kind of travel a little bit without actually traveling, you know, cause Oasis, you know, you listen to Oasis and that's just got England all over it, it's cloudy <laughs> and, you know, uh, gray and cold and rainy. Um, 
And, and so I guess when I was younger, I really got tuned into that, how it made me feel the emotions that it could drag out of me. And then fast forward, I guess, to a few years ago, I was really looking for something creative. There was that big missing need that wasn't being satisfied. And I'd always loved writing. I always loved music. And it, it's, it's tough to really say why that clarity came out, but something in me said, go buy a guitar and start doing this and accept that you're going to be, you know, you're going to not be the greatest at it for, for quite a while. Um, but just go through the process and do it. And that's how I started. So that was going to be my question is, is that the first step for you? Was it getting an instrument as, or were you writing poetry and words and stuff prior to that? I started writing poetry. Um, I started to put together some lyrics, especially, I don't know that I would have identified it as poetry, but throughout my life, I've had these moments where words became really clear in my head and I would write them down or maybe I just tell them to go away. And I, I never really thought of it as a thing that I would do. It, it just, you know, we weren't, my mom played some guitar once in a while. I, I've never heard her play, but, but I know that she used to love to, and still has a beautiful 12 string, but, uh, but, you know, we weren't a musical family. We were creative in our own ways, you know, but, mm -hmm. but that wasn't really what I set out to do with my life, I guess. So, um, when I started to, I, I went through some, some stress and anxiety for a while and I found myself just writing out short lines of things because that was the only way I could release that pressure, you know, that tension I'd be in the gym and I'd be lifting and I would just start, I'd open up Microsoft word on my phone and I would just start typing stuff in. And, and that's kind of how it started. I mean, it was just, you know, my Sunday mornings, my workouts would take, you know, two hours because I would just start <laughs> writing things out. Just my biggest fears, my worst anxieties, you know, things I was thinking, things I was feeling into those. And that's kind of how it began. I mean, it was a, a tremendous feeling of relief when I could do that, that I just couldn't find any other way. One of the things that I want to do with the channel is really focus on people who are writing songs at home and that might be beginners it might be people who are a little more experienced you know so i think hearing that you started three years ago and you know you you had the bug bite you and i think we all have the bug bite us at different times in our lives but i think it's interesting to to hear that you were sort of ready to immerse yourself it sounds like once you had that in your head you were like this is what i'm this is the direction i'm going are you sort of like that in general, or is, is songwriting something that is unique in that respect? Oh, no, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I came to this with, a with more of a willingness to be the student than I ever had for anything else that I did. Cool. Um, I really, it, it was a very vulnerable process of kind of stripping away that need to be the, um, I wouldn't say I've ever felt the need to be the smartest person in the room, but there was definitely a, you know, there was definitely, there have been times in my career where I knew that I couldn't convey any sense of um, lack of confidence, shall we say. And there's nothing more vulnerable than making art and sharing it with other people. Um, I guess, aside from a relationship, if you do it right, but, but that is a kind of relationship too. Um, so, in a way, yeah, I, <clears throat> in a way, what you say, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but when you say art is kind of like a relationship with ourselves or like, and it's some internal relationship on, on how we deal with things that are, that we experience, right? That's kind of a, that's a unique way to, to look at it for sure. It is. Yeah. And I mean, um, so I, I was listening to an interview, um, I, I've listened to interviews with artists, you know, and um, I was listening to to Joel talk about her process and and one of her insights was really interesting. She said, you know, if you, you know, when you when you choose not to be in relationship with something, it 
it, I, I'm paraphrasing and I'm going to get this wrong, but I, I think she said, you know, you can't, you can't have a relationship with something that doesn't change you, you know, or, um, mm. I'm, I think I got that wrong, but, but, you know, <laughs> it, it was that notion that when you're in a relationship with something, it really changes you. And with music, the really nice thing is it, it allowed me to be a beginner um, at something, which I don't think is something that a lot of people really get to do so much past a certain point. Um, because you, you associate that with being a kid, right? So yeah, when you when you're a kid, you know, you're, you're expected to try a bunch of stuff and, and do crazy things. And then once you hit 21, you're supposed to have it set. <laughs> and that's not that's not necessarily the reality. And in fact, I would argue that the best way to stay young is to keep trying new stuff because you fill out more of your perimeter that way as a person. Well, it definitely keeps life more interesting. That's for sure. You know, yeah. with having songwriting and different artistic things, it, it, you kind of never get bored really. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, you do, I do get bored, but they say boredom actually is a, a spark of creativity because it makes you think in a different way. But um, it's interesting to hear you talk about the, the being in the newness. It makes me think back to how I started. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, I used to listen to the radio with my mom in the car and it was, you know, the early eighties and it was like Dolly Parton, Elton John, um Billy Joel like those types of artists on AM radio and my mom would always sing in the car and I would remember all of those songs and it never clicked with me that people could make those things and I also thought those artists were at the radio station performing when their song was on the radio too I didn't okay. realize that it was recorded I actually thought that Dolly Parton oh, was at the radio station singing um but and I, I think it was in like third grade and I went to my cousin's house and my cousin had an electronic keyboard and you could push a button and it would play music. And it was just like, now I went from listening to cassettes on my little tape recorder and recording things like audio. And then it was like a whole new world just was like dropped on me that it's like, wow, wow like you can make music. Like, and that was like the instant that I wanted keyboards and all of that stuff. Um, and my parents got me one for Christmas that year. And then I just started teaching myself how to match what I was listening to. And eventually I got more keyboards and, and all of these things. And then in high school, I ended up buying um, my own computer, more keyboards. You know, I basically had a job so I could support my music habit. Um, and, you know, fast forward, and I still am just as much into this as, as I was back then. So it's, it's, it it's kind of one of those things that doesn't go away once it has you and it's it was probably always there to begin with so you probably just discovered it and, and you mentioned to me you learned through a lot of experimentation as well i mean that's, totally. that had to be um that had to be a a really cool way to to get started i mean you you learned by ear right i did learn by ear and it wasn't so much like, you know, some people, they are have perfect pitch and it's like they can hear something and they can just go play it. Like I didn't have that experience, but what I did was I would just push the keys until it matched, like until it resonated with what, what I was listening to and then tried to figure out like, oh, well, that's that note. How does it go somewhere else? And then my dad had a guitar book and in that guitar book, it had a list of like chords and then other notes that could go with it. And it was like, it started to click with me that there's a, a, a method to putting songs together because I used to think that you just randomly picked stuff until it sounded good. I didn't realize right. that there was actually scales and chords and like all of these things that you can learn what goes with what to put it together. Yeah. So it was like, it, it was this evolution over time of realizing that these people are writing these songs by knowing what goes together well, instead of just totally starting from nothing, if that makes sense. And isn't that interesting too? I don't mean to derail your questions either or anything like that. With this, no, this is great. Isn't it really interesting how 
if there's a um ah your buddies are in the background that's great yes they are <laughs> yep it's at home songwriting with the dogs oh yes i love it i love it <laughs> they're a part of the process too right they are they usually sit right back there on that that little couch so they're usually in the studio so oh that's great <laughs> but but you know isn't it funny because until you until you begin to learn the rules you know it looks like magic right but the reality is there's someone learned how to do all of these things you know you you pick your favorite song ever right and there is a formula there's a way that someone arrived at that song you know none of us are um you know you might stumble on some things by accident but there's a way that someone learned how to do that. Nobody just woke up their first day on this planet and was magically imbued with some um, amazing skill to create something out of nothing. Every single one of these songs that we listen to and enjoy, somebody learned the skills to come up with those songs, even if it's they learned the skills for how to experiment in the right way to come up with that song. And there it's that's the important thing about this. There's a process. You can learn it. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take time. It may take more or less investment than it might be, you know, someone else. I mean, it, everyone's different. But I think that was my main approach to this process. Going back to your question a while ago is that there's something that can be learned here if you just take the time to learn it. Um, and I think that was the that was the mantra that I was trying to follow. What was what were those steps? So obviously you said you went and you you um you know decided you wanted to get into this. You went and bought a guitar. That was sort of your step in in that direction. What was the next step then? Did you get home and you're like, now I have a guitar. Now what? Oh man, so <laughs> You're gonna laugh at this, but I'll I'll be honest. I I looked at the guy at Guitar Center and I said, uh, "How do I do this?" <laughs> <laughs> it, it really it really was uh, it, it really was me sitting there staring at the guitar, thinking, "All right, what do I, what do I do next with you?" <laughs> <laughs> but you um, know what, though, I mean, I think there's somebody out there in your shoes, right? Like, yeah. That, if you don't know, you don't know. I mean, somebody might be at that stage of like, I don't, you know, I, when you said, I don't know how to tune it. It's like, wow. Like you knew how you knew that it needed to be tuned. Right. So that's yeah. step in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, it's, it's kind of, um, to answer your question, once the tuning was out of the way, uh, I, you know, I had a relative, uh, my, uh, my uncle, he played some guitar and, and so, uh, went over to, you know, we met up and, and he showed me a few things to get started. But, um, one of the things that I did somewhat early on that was really good and that I'd recommend to anybody is to get a teacher. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great musicians out there who are very eager to share what they know and, uh, people love to teach things. I mean, it's just, a it's, you know, it's, it's great. It's, it's a fun yeah. It benef the teaching relationship benefits the teacher and the student, you know, so it was something that I resisted early on, but, but that was the really big next step that I had to take. And so the asking for help, I guess, is what you could call it. Um, and it was worth it. Absolutely. So my journey, once I started to get keyboards and things, like I said, I started learning by ear yeah. and I was the kid that just locked himself in, into my bedroom and that's all I did was listen to music and fumble around with a keyboard and, nice. and all of these things. Like I didn't, I mean, I had a couple of close friends that we would do stuff with, but I was that sort of person that was always just like in my room playing music, just that was my escape from everything else. And I'm still kind of like that as an adult. I mean, my life kind of revolves around music, even though I do have a, another job that pays the bills, but, um, I think for me, I was also young and a little bit cocky and thought like, I'm going to be rich and famous. And this is a way that I'm going to, you know, make money and, you know, kind of 
be the artist that I saw on TV and sort of who I looked up to. And I knew that if they can do it, I can do it. And I would try to match their music the best that I could. So it was really learning through imitation. But when I was younger, I used to think that like I knew everything. So even when I first started, you know, as an adult joining like songwriting groups and things, there was a little bit of an ego that I had to sort of break because I didn't know that I had anything to learn. But then when I started to actually take courses through like Berkeley College of Music and like just there was more access on the internet and there's different books, that was when I discovered like, wow, there's things going on within songs where I'm like mind blown, right? Like stuff that's hidden in plain sight that people actually think about as they're writing. And that was just like, wow. And then once I knew that stuff, I thought the best way to learn is to teach. So that was when I started to think about doing workshops and classes and different things like that. And now the next step of that is this YouTube channel. So thanks for you being here and also the people watching, but that's kind of, you know, this isn't all about me all the time, but that's kind of part of my story as well. Well, I did want to ask you, so what was it like to go into that first songwriting? What was it? a? I assume it was some kind of a meeting, right? Was it a song share? What was it a class or? So the first actual meeting that I went to, it was shortly after I had moved to Minnesota. So I grew up in South Dakota, lived there till I was like 29. And I, I always liked Prince and Janet Jackson. And nice. they recorded in Minneapolis and Minneapolis sort of had the pop funk, you know, dance music scene that I liked. So I wanted to be closer to that. When I moved here, I was like, I want to just get immersed in what's happening. So I looked online and, and I found the Minnesota Association of Songwriters. And I'm like, this sounds like what I want to do. So I just, they used to have um, in-person meetings at uh, McNally Smith um, College of Music, which was in St. Paul. It's now closed. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but they would have monthly meetings where you would bring your songs and you would play them. And I remember coming to a review meeting one of the first times, and I really liked this song that I, had, that I had written. I remember the title was called Dear Love, and I had written it about somebody that I had a crush on. And they reviewed it and they were like, it sounds good, but we don't know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And, and <laughs> at that time, I was like, you guys don't get it. You know, like it, of course, of course you like, you know, why don't you get it? So yeah. it took a while to realize that, yeah, if multiple people are saying they don't understand your song, it probably, they don't get it. So it's not working, you know? So, but it was, it was a combination of humbling and also it sort of pissed me off at the same time, if that makes sense. Like I wanted to defend my artistic choices, but at the same time, try to learn, which was a weird mix. And yeah. it's, it's weird to show your art and your songs to someone else. Like it's, it's like, I think it's about the equivalent of if somebody said like strip all your clothes off and like walk into this group of people, because it's like, that's your, that's your art, that's your thing. And now all of a sudden people are like looking at it with a critical eye. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and gosh, you know, um, what happens if, you know, something I said comes across wrong or what if somebody hears it and their interpretation is way out of left field or, you know, it, it, what if, you know, I listen to it and I, you know, while, I, while we're there and it just, you know, all these things run through my head whenever we're in a song share um, for MAS, for example, it's, it's, it is such a vulnerable thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it can be, tough i find it tough sometimes to even just get something ready to, to submit because you know i i know you've written lots and lots of songs too um it you know you, you write stuff and you try to you try to pick the stuff that you think is the best but it can be a bit of a it can be a bit opaque as to what's going to really resonate no pun intended with people you know what what are they going to get what are they not um, what's going to make sense? What won't? It's funny that you say that too, because I have songs that I write where I just write them and I don't think about 
all of the structure all the time. I don't think about making everything perfect. And it's like, I just want to write something because I should write something. Yeah. And those songs, what's funny about it is I'm kind of not the best judge to know when those songs are working and when they're not, because a lot of times I don't like those songs because they're not as technically good, right? Like they don't, they're not checking all the boxes, but then I'll play it for someone else and they'll be like, oh, I really like that song. And then the song that I spent hours like going over every last little piece, then you play it and they're like, eh, it's okay. It's pretty good. Yeah. And it's like, what? So it's, it's, it's weird. But I know like, how do you decide what you're going to play at a, a review meeting? It's like, I, I yeah. don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Well, and I don't know about you, but one of the really big things that I had to that I, I constantly have to deal with. You know, I, I look at my favorite singer songwriters and there's just this thing that their songs communicate. There's this, there's this image about them that their songs communicate it's, or there's a, there's a, there's some intangible quality. And my biggest source of writer's block, the thing that, that if I'm not super careful and if I don't, you know, keep it in check is I want to, I want to, you know, signal the right, bring the right qualities forward, right? To try and concoct this intangible quality for myself, for my own songs. But, but that's like saying, what, so what I'll do is I'll reject everything in the process that doesn't quite fit into that. And mm. a song is a point that you arrive at. It's not a thing under, at least for me, it's not a thing under ego control. It's a, I, I can't just sit down and say, I'm going to write a good song today um, because it doesn't, it doesn't work. Good is such a subjective term. It, it seems to me um, in this process that, you know, you may, you may have written a thousand songs or you, or 2000 or, or whatever, but you know, there's a certain level of expertise that you get to when the uh, accident part of it turns out to be something tangible. You know, the, the people who get paid, you know, a lot of money to do this, to me, that has to be such a nerve wracking process because I would think, okay, I wrote this one, but there's no guarantee that I'll get the next one, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I have that feeling a lot actually, where I feel like I'll write a really good song or it feels really good. Like I like listening to it. Other people seem to like it. And it feels, and I've heard, I heard, um, I think it was Natalie Merchant back in the day had said she has this same feeling. And I was like, that's what I feel. But she basically said, it feels like the well dries up and you're like, that's it. It was a good run. That's yep. the best I got. We're done. Like nothing else is coming. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you hit another spot where it's like, wow, this is really good again. And then again, it dries yep. up. And it's not writer's block. It's not like you're not writing, but it's like the something happens where your mind, I think what happens is your mind gets to a point where it gets used to things and it needs to find a new way of doing it. And you have to break through that in order to sort of hit the really good stuff. So it's like chipping and like panning for gold in a way, if that yeah. makes sense. Well, and those are the times when experimentation is really great. Um, because I, I so really good, really good sort of mini anecdote here is that uh, I went through a, a big uh, period this summer where I, I couldn't come up with anything that that I even wanted to record, you know, and all it took was getting a partial capo for my guitar and playing around with a picking pattern that I had um, put together with uh, one of my with my guitar teacher to, to really, um, come up with something new and some other words kind of followed that. And, uh, and it was just a, it, it changed the process. It gave me something new to grab onto is what I mean to say. And that can, that can happen. You know, if you just change one thing, sometimes the pieces fall into place, but it is a process of faith. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, this has been a semi-religious experience and I wouldn't otherwise call myself a very religious person, but 
you know, there is this intangible ethereal quality to it where you have to keep writing and expect that something's going to come up to meet you. And when it does, it's like, oh, okay. And if you do that enough times, you start to realize, okay, I've been here before and it'll come back, but I just have to keep going. So I've heard, um, I think it was like Elton John and like a few other like really well-known songwriters say that, you know, when the muse strikes, it's almost like you're channeling from somewhere else because it just sort of, the songs sort of write themselves at times. Um, and I think that's true. I think we are sort of tapping into something, you know, whatever you believe in, but it's like the, everything has to align to lead up to that point. And I think the other days when you are writing, it's, you would never get to the good stuff if you didn't have those other days, right? Like you, you can't jump from the beginning to the end without sort of going on that, that adventure or whatever that, that is. And I think, you know, we were talking, you were talking about pro songwriters. I was listening to an interview with Ashley Gorley this week and Ashley has written, I think 50 number one or 51 number one country songs. So he like, if he knows how to write a song, if anybody knows how to write a song, it's Ashley Gorley, right? Yeah. And he said that he writes one to two songs every day. And he's done that. He did that for seven years before he had a hit. Yeah. So he, he had a publishing deal for seven years before he even had one hit. And he wrote one to two songs every single day. And I haven't done the math on what that adds up to, but I think it's like over 200 some songs a year. That's 200 times seven, that's like 1500 songs yeah. just to get to one hit. So um, I know that you are a fan of the artist way. Um, oh, yes. And that author says like, we take care of the quantity and God takes care of the quality. And I think yep. there's something to be said for, for that, for sure. Well, you better really get invested in this process. If you, if you really want to get serious about this and, and I say you better like, look, this is, <laughs> this is what you make it. If you, yeah. if you're happy, you know, however you're doing this, if you're happy with it and it's getting you what you want, then keep, keep on. I, I'm the last to ever judge anybody's process or, you know, whatever it may look like, because it's at the end of the day, this has to serve you. But what I would say is that if you're, if this is something you really want to be pragmatic about, find a daily practice, you know, find a, a, a way that you can do this every day. And I'm a huge fan of the artist way. Yes, because um, not only did that give me a thing that I could do every day, i.e. the morning pages, um, but it brought this thing I wanted to do more into alignment with whatever deep and strange things live in me. So <laughs> it was, it, you know, cause there, cause a big component is the morning pages and you know, yeah. you're not going to write things that make sense at six or 5.00 AM in the morning or whenever you wake up. Um, and that's kind of the point because you end up on some pretty cool new insights there. If you, if you commit to that. Um, but that's, you know, I agree with that. And that's why whenever we have someone, you know, come in, you know, to MAS, for example, like last time I asked, you know, what is your daily process or practice like? Because that's, I think that's what matters the most. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that as you watch the videos on this channel, it's really about practicing the craft in order to be ready when the right inspiration strikes. Because I hear a lot of people yeah. come up to me and they say, how can you teach a songwriting workshop when like you can't teach art? And I'm like, well, you can teach people about paint, right? Like I might not be able to teach you how to become Picasso, but you have to know how to use the tools. And I think what, what, what we're talking about today is really training your mind to be creative. So you're open to those ideas. And then when those ideas do show up, what do you do with them at that point? Because I think that's the other you know, there's a lot of people who have good ideas, right? Like I've heard people say like, that could be a song or I've got a good idea for a song, but it's like awesome idea, but how are you going to execute it? And I think that's what separates really good songs from just okay songs is how does it execute on the idea? Because think of how many love songs there are, right? Like love yeah. has been written about 
a gajillion times. Like that's probably the official count at this point, but yet there's still songs that just like rip your heart out when you hear them. And it's like after millions and millions of songs, people still have the ability to do that. And I think that is what's so cool about that. And I think there's, there's even a mystery to like, I think there's something special about songwriters just period. Like, I think we just tap into something and, and music is sort of the universal language. And then when we put words to it, 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 it just, it's just a, a, I don't even know what I'm saying, but do you, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah. it's, there's magic. You had mentioned, I think the word magic before, and, and that's really what it is. Well, it, it, it is amazing. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's kind of, it is kind of crazy that we as people respond to tones and rhythms and, and, and words set on these things. I mean, what an amazing thing that somebody came up with this idea to, you know, whack a stick on a, on a log and, and say words to it. You know, I don't know what, what the first instruments really were, but sure. you know, it, it, it's a crazy thing. And then, and then to be able to say something, I mean, say something of meaning in, in that, um, you know, music always allowed me to feel stuff that I couldn't otherwise feel. Um, it, it was a, a, a safer place to feel like, Oh, I'm sad today. And, and I'm going to listen to this song and the song is going to make me feel better because it's going to, to resonate with something that I can't otherwise describe. Um, and I think that's amazing. I think that's, that is the magic of this. Um, and you know, to your point about practice, I would say that, you know, another way to, to think about this is that um, I think there's, I think if you're a really pragmatic person, I, I am um, for sure, you know, it's easy to invest that energy in, I want to write a really good song. That's kind of intangible because good is subjective and good is also kind of a word that um, can, can judge and judgment is kind of not you don't want really want to introduce judgment too early in this process. Judgment yeah. can be good at some point in the process, but, but not, you know, eventually not quite yet, you know, and yeah. um, one thing that you, you could invest that, that in instead is how am I going to get better today? What's something I can do to get better? Maybe I'm going to play two chords together that I never played before. Or um, maybe uh, the other day I recorded uh, guitar and banjo on the same, you know, in the same couple tracks or, you know, together and, and cool. messed around with that a little bit. And that wasn't something I'd ever done before. So does um, the does the guitar inspire you differently than the banjo does? I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that because I think the problem I have with guitar is is I've gotten really good at writing songs in G, okay. <laughs> and uh, and I think the nice thing about the banjo is you know it's a stringed instrument the paradigm's kind of the same, um, but I feel like because I don't know because I don't have the same mapping imposed on it that I do to the guitar, I'm I'm free to think about it by ear a little bit better. Sure, that makes sense. Well, you know, I think somebody had said that the majority of Max Martin songs are written in the key of G. So, you nice. know, that's <laughs> not a bad key. Um, what did you, so uh, if I may ask, you know, you, you yeah. learn multiple instruments then at, at once, then do you think that that helped you get a good grasp on, on, you know, being a songwriter in general? Well, so the really the only instruments that I know how to play are keyboards. So um, like, I don't, I don't know how to play guitar. I can fumble through chords, but everything that I do is done electronically or playing from a keyboard. So like, even if I'm doing drum programming, I'm, you know, playing the rhythms from the keys, or if I'm doing like a guitar part, I can sort of fake the guitar part. Sure. Um, but what I did learn, I think, just through very active listening and just really paying attention is how those things should sound together. Like, it yeah. would be like, okay, what's the bass line doing? And what are the drums doing? And like, what kind of synth lines are they using? And and I would learn by trying to recreate what I heard. Yes. And 
you know, to me that those are helpful, helpful things that helped me in sort of my journey. Um, but not everybody has to be a, like a producer like I am, because I kind of saw myself as more of like a producer where I was going to be creating a full track and writing songs because my um, influences and who I really looked up to were Prince and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. You know, they kind of had that Minneapolis thing. Yeah. Um, and they um, they did everything themselves. Right. Like Jam and Lewis, you know, uh, Lewis played the bass and Jimmy Jam played the keyboards and like they just they they made that sound and Prince was the same way where Prince could basically play everything and he was sort of a one man band and I always thought it was cool that everything said written produced performed by Prince yeah nice right. and I wanted that to be you know written produced and performed by Chad right so that was what I looked up to and and kind of what what guided me um, so it was and growing up in South Dakota, the type of music I was into was not what everybody else was into, you know, it was country music and rock and roll. And, you know, my dad used to listen to like seventies, like rock music, um, you know, like Fleetwood Mac and, and like Leonard Skinner and like all of these things. So like my influences were all of these things that had to be popular enough to make it to South Dakota. So I yeah. always listened, everything I listened to was some level of popular. So my style has always been pop oriented. Like yeah. I never knew there were folk artists and stuff like our radio station. We didn't have access to that, which is interesting. So. Well, and, and now we can dial anything up, right? I mean, I think it's crazy that you and I can put stuff on the major streaming platforms and, and it's just there alongside our other, you know, our other artists, you know, our favorite artists, the people that inspired us, our music can be there. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that's quite cool. I mean, to me that, that realizes the promise of the internet, which was supposed to be that everyone could publish, everyone could be an artist, you know, um, which it, is just really neat. No, it, it, it is pretty amazing that I could record a song here and within hours, someone across the world could hear it. Yep. And it cost me next to nothing, right? Like, so, and it it's, the other thing is, is when I was growing up, music equipment was so expensive that you had to go to a studio or you had to like really save up and buy these things. And now the pros and us who are just, you know, at home people, we have the same exact tools. So it's all about how do you use them? And I think it's, it's a, it's an interesting change to the, the industry as a whole. And I think it's exciting because it comes back when, when access is the same, it comes back to quality because yeah. I think if, if access isn't the same, whoever has the most money can rise to the top. But now it's like, oh, well, you've got a lot of money, but nobody, but everybody else is going to what's actually good. So I think it's, it's, it's an interesting time to, yeah, to really yeah. be in this stuff for sure. And I think it's a more important time than ever to really lean into the basics. I mean, really, you know, really leaning into your craft, um, really even so, so, you know, let's say you've written a bunch of songs, you know, to, you know, to someone who's getting started, you know, you've written a bunch of songs and you, you like them, you know, go out and get feedback, you know, go out and, and be vulnerable like that. Go out and play your stuff for other people. Listen to what they say. See if what they're responding with is what you're comfortable with them responding to. And then when you do get the feedback that, and because everyone will get feedback that they don't like, um, yes, you know, deal with the psychological frustrations of that because they, they will be there there. Every time I share a song, I always have to, you know, push myself a little harder the next day to pick up the pen again. But, yeah. um, you know, once you have gone through that, then look at the hard truths of what you're doing. You know, again, if you're, if you're trying to move beyond a certain point, if you want to keep moving forward in this, you're not satisfied with where you're at look at the hard truths because yeah, you can post music up there and it'll probably stay there for a very long time, uh, forever maybe. 
and yeah. you want to make sure that what you're putting out there is what you want out there, you know? So that's probably our time for today, but Patrick, before we wrap up, do you have any sort of last minute, I guess, pieces of advice for someone who might be sitting at home and wanting to learn more about songwriting? Like, what do you suggest to them to sort of take that next step? Well, I think that the, um, I think that the Minnesota resources are, are excellent and, and what you're putting together here on your channel are, are excellent places to start. Um, I would say that I'm going to give the same advice that everybody gives, which is keep writing. But, but I think focus on that daily practice, focus on ways to refine your practice, make it very meta. You know, I, I, I want to get better at practicing, you know, or I want to get better at finding new ways to write better. You know, that's, that's the best advice I can give is to treat it like an ongoing process of a process. Awesome. Well, Patrick, thanks so much for, for joining us on this edition of at home songwriting. Um, Everybody else, thanks for joining us as well. If you like what you're watching and what you're hearing, make sure you like and subscribe. And coming up on the next screen, you'll see some other videos to learn about the practice and the craft of songwriting. And we'll see you next time here at At Home Songwriting. Thanks, everybody.